Well, thank you all. Here I am. I want to begin, as I always do, by thanking Dave Whelan of the Talbot and the Talbot Spy for creating this partnership with the Talbot County Free Library. It gives me the opportunity to speak with terrific writers and poets from across the country. And my guest today is a really interesting lady. Um, I, 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 I've subscribed to Scientific American, uh, uh, mainly because that way, you know, I can carry it around in airports and people see it and think I'm smart. Um, the, the, the November issue of Scientific American has a terrific article in it by Ann Finkbeiner, my guest, about war in space. Uh, I think the title, title of the article itself is Orbital Aggression, and I read it and was just fascinated. Uh, and so I called her up and asked if she would join us, and she has, which is very kind of her. And I want to begin by reading just a, a brief bio, uh, mainly because I'm afraid I'll forget something. Uh, Anne Finkbeiner was an English major in college, but what she likes to do is write about science. Currently, she writes for Science, Nature, Scientific American, and Quanta, among others. She's the proud co-proprietor of a blog that often concerns itself with science, the last word on nothing. And I've, I've checked out this blog, and if you get a chance, you should read it. It's, it's really pretty neat. She's got some good stuff on there, and she's got interesting people corresponding with her. She has also written for Mosaic, Discover, Sky and Telescope, Astronomy, USA Today, Defense Technology International, The Wilson Quarterly, The Wall Street Journal, Nature, and The New York Times. Jeez. She is the author of a number of books, including The Jasons, The Secret History of Science's Post-War Elite, A Grand and Bold Thing, An Extraordinary New Map of the Universe, Ushering in a New Era of Discovery, and After the Death of a Child, Living with Loss Through, year, through the Years. She is also the creator of what is now called, in her honor, the Thinkbiner Test, which provides readers with a simple way to determine if something they are reading about a great artist, scientist, or national leader who happens to be a woman is sexist, which I guess means that after reading this terrific bio, if I then went on and said, and on top of all that, she's a woman, <laughs> I would fail the think finder test. And thank you so much for being with us. Oh, I'm very pleased. Okay, and can you tell us a little bit about yourself? How did an English major end up falling in love with science and writing about it. I really am an English major in life. I, I still read only novels. I, I rarely read nonfiction. Um, but I was, I, I, I was doing one of the things that English, t English majors do, which is teaching. Um, I was teaching in a program for gifted junior high school students. And I enjoyed it, but I found myself getting a little itchy. They were doing these neat projects and learning these neat things, and I wasn't doing that. Um, I mean, I wasn't doing it for myself. So, so in the midst of this sort of itchiness, I took a trip um, west. I live in Baltimore. and. I took a trip through on the Pennsylvania Turnpike from central Pennsylvania out to Chicago. And what the Turnpike does is it crosses the whole Appalachian chain of mountains. And so looking out the window, I could see that when you're going up a mountain, the lines in the road cut, you know, those lines, sure. they were going up. And then when I was going down the mountain, the lines went down. And so I thought, okay, fine. I mean, I didn't think about it. I was an English major. And then I noticed that when we got out around Pittsburgh, the lines going up the mountains and the lines going down the mountains, they didn't do that anymore. They were just flat, regardless of whether I was going up or down, they were flat. And I thought for the first time in my life, why don't I know more about the world? So I, um, I started taking night school courses um, in the sciences. I took some in poetry and film and stuff like that and got bored. But it was the sciences, the ones that really interested me. And they were night school courses, so they didn't have math in them and they, didn't, they weren't really difficult. I mean, they were intellectually difficult, but 
in a way I could handle. Um, and one of them, which was um, sort of a night school geology course, um, the teacher was, he was a geologist, but he was natively a storyteller. And so each lecture was a story about whatever the night's subject was. And I thought I could do that. And so I, um, I had a, went to a graduate program in science writing for nine months and then gave myself a couple of years to as freelance and make what I had made as a junior high school teacher as make that as a writer. And I didn't quite make it, but I thought the heck with it. <laughs> I'll just go with it. So I've been doing it ever since. And so that was like, I don't know, 35, 40 years ago, a long time ago. Long well, you're, ago. you're really good at it. I could say, tell you that for sure. And, and, and the storytelling part of it, I think is, is very important. And, uh, and, and, and you're, you're a, a, the, 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 an excellent example of, of good storytelling. And one of the stories that you tell uh, at the beginning of your Scientific Americans uh, uh, article was about the amateur satellite watching network um, and, and something that they observed in the sky above. Can you tell us that story? I can, I can. So the amateur satellite watching network, I can talk more about them later if you'd like, but I am very fond of those people. I don't know any of them. I mean, I know them on Twitter. I know them from emails, but I don't know any of them. And they are um, just sort of normal people. They're often astronomers um, or amateur astronomers, um, but they're all kinds of people who just spend their nights looking at the sky with binoculars or little, you know, normal telescopes and, um, and watching the satellites go by. And they can tell an awful lot about a satellite by looking at it, which doesn't make sense to me, but it does to them. And um, this one satellite, the, the person who was watching it was um, a, a graduate student in astronomy somewhere. And he said, you know, there's this, what was known to be a Soviet, a Russian satellite that was sort of bird dogging an American spy satellite. They knew it was a spy satellite. So, you know, the Russian satellite would go up to the spy satellite and hang around it for a day or so. And then the spy satellite would move off and then the Russian satellite would follow it. And then the spy satellite would move off again. And then the Russian satellite would follow it again. And so he was putting all of this on Twitter. And, um, and I thought I had this assignment from Scientific American to write about space war. And I thought, I wonder if that's what the space war looks like. So, that's that story. And is that, is that kind of what space war would be like? Exactly, exactly. You know, it sounds, space war sounds like it's, you know, Buck Rogers up there shooting off lasers at satellites and stuff like that. Or it sounds like it's using satellites to bomb things on Earth. And neither one of those things is true. Space war is just a war on satellites. And there are a number of ways to knock out satellites, to do war on satellites, but it's just a war on satellites. That's what it is. You're off audio. <laughs> You're mute. <laughs> you know, I'm not very good at science. You'll have to forgive me. And Zoom no, this qualifies is, this as is science. Technology. This yeah. is technology. Oh, you can right. be bad at science. Yeah, the, you can uh, be bad. You it, can be bad at technology. Ma it's all magic to me. At any rate, the uh, uh, talking about what you said about satellites. At one point in your article, you said, and I'm I'm quoting here, and I hope I get it right. Satellites enable modern civilization. That's a pretty powerful little statement. And if it's true, what does that mean for us? If there's a space war involving satellites. Oh, it means we're screwed. 
Um, <laughs> we're, we're cooked. We're <laughs> too bad. Um, space, the satellites, um, the satellites do, it's, they do so much that it's hard to narrow it down, but they do most of the communications. They do all the communi the international global communications. And so that can be anything from, oh, and they do all the GPS. So, you know, getting to the grocery store in another county, you couldn't do that. You have to go to your own grocery store. Um, the communications are, you know, TV, radio, um, all the, the um, somehow the internet, um, it's just all run by satellites, off of satellites, using satellites. Sat satellites mediate all of this. It would be like taking cars out or something. Um, so yeah, I'm saying that even, even hospitals could be affected if they knocked out satellites. Well, every, all the modern, anything we can do remotely, there's a good chance it's run, it's run through a satellite. Um, it's mediated by a satellite. So yeah, sure, the electronic health systems, the, um, the banking system, the global grid, you know, by which elect, uh, electricity is apportioned, um, everything, GPS. <laughs> To, to say nothing of, of our military's ability to, to tell what's happening with what, what our adversaries are doing, right? Yeah, and that's when people, the people who get worried about space war, when they get worried, that's actually what they're worrying about. They're worrying because we have a gazillion communication satellites. And so does everybody else. But we have a handful of military satellites. So the satellites that watch for missiles, you know, that might be coming our way, or the satellites that mediate like command and control, you know, between the commanders and the people who have to go out and fight, um, all the spy satellites, the big spy satellites, there are a handful of those. There's like, like six of one kind and 10 of another kind. And, you know, they could be easily, easily, our, our military could be easily shut down. Uh, hobbled. The, uh, um, uh, and and would, would a space war, if that happened, would that be harder on the US or, or, or on our adversaries? Yeah, it's much harder on us. Um, and that's the military business. Um, now, a lot of more developing countries don't rely on the internet as much as we do, or rely on satellites generally as much as we do. But certainly Western Europe and China and you know Russia, they all rely heavily on satellites. Um, but the military, I, I didn't know this and I still don't quite understand it, I think. But um, that handful of military satellites that we have is sort of uniquely vulnerable. And the other thing is, other countries have spy satellites, but they don't need the command and control military stuff. And because they are not the policemen for the world the way America is. So they can, they can find out stuff about you know, the, the people that are infringing on their borders, they can find that out other ways. So that's why, that's what, that's what the space war people worry about. And, and in your article, you, you mentioned that Donald Rumsfeld of all people, at one point headed a commission uh, that looked into the, the, the concerns about space war. And he, he came, he warned of a, a, what he called a space Pearl Harbor. Um, could such a thing happen? And what would it look like? Would it happen as quickly as Pearl Harbor did? Oh, um, sure. 
um, yeah, um, somebody could take out the, um, the command and control satellites. Um, I, I'm, not sh I'm not sure exactly how that would happen, but they could do it. And we wouldn't have a military that could talk to itself anymore. Yeah, they'd, be, they'd be blinded, basically. Yeah, right. And it could happen quickly. Um, now, bear in mind that Rumsfeld said that space Pearl Harbor, which is, I'm going to briefly digress here. One of the ways to get your message across, if you're in the government, is to come up with a phrase that newspaper people will like. And space Pearl Harbor is one of those. So he knew what he was doing. Um, that was in 2001. Now, number one, the situation has gotten more, you know, if it's, if it's, if it's push against shove, there's more push and there's more shove. The, the situation has gotten worse, but it's, it's not like space war is any more likely than it ever was. So that's, you know, 19 years. And what happened was he got all excited about it. He had this commission. He, at the end, toward the end of the commission, he became um, secretary of defense. So he could do something about it, but it was January, 2001. And in September, the nation's in defense's attention turned elsewhere for the next 20 years. Yeah, it sure did. Everything changed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, but if, if, if we, if, if, if Rumsfeld's concerns uh, came, came to fruition, uh, what, what, what sort of weaponry would be used in space? You mentioned in your article something, I don't know how to pronounce it, day asset. Oh, uh, yeah. That, it's an acronym. Okay. It's just the military being military. Sure. ASAT is anti-satellite. So you can have a lot of different assets, a lot of different kinds of things that attack satellites. But DA asset is a direct descent asset. Guess what that is? <laughs> it's a missile that blows a satellite out of the sky. That's what that is. So that's one way you could do it, a missile from the ground blowing a satellite out of the sky. Or you can have a, um, I've forgotten their acronym for this. Uh, it's, it's a catchphrase, not an acronym. Um, you can have another satellite up there, you know, shooting a little thing, a little weapon at one of our satellites and knocking it out. Um, or you can do something that's more subtle and harder to, and by the way, these capabilities, these things, these missiles and these satellites that shoot other satellites, those exist. I mean, those are, in fact, kind of oldish technology. They, they're around. Um, and the other thing that's around but more subtle is what they call electronic, um, electromagnetic warfare or something. I, I, they have so many catchphrases and I kind of lose their meaning after a while. But that is um, jamming. You can jam the signals. You know, I'm, I'm sending you a signal. Somebody in the middle could keep the signal from getting there. Um, they can spoof the signal. They can say, for instance, if you send a GPS signal, they can, and, and uh, so, so you know where this ammunition dump is and you're gonna go take care of it. But they can then by spoofing the ammunition dump, they can, that signal, they can move it over to 20 miles away and then you go attack something 20 miles away. Um, those are done too, routinely. So and, all and of this is possible. Sure. And now we have a new uh, US space force uh, that we're all reading about. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about that? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh. We'd have to kill you? <laughs> no, I mean, throughout this whole, I mean, I'm just, a, I'm just a writer. So I just call up people and ask them questions. And when you call up the Department of Defense or Space Force, the answers you get are not illuminating. They are not substantive. 
They don't tell you anything you couldn't have figured out by thinking about it for five minutes. Um, so I really don't know what Space Force, Force is doing in particular. In general, they're sort of still pulling themselves together. Um, they are figuring out what kinds of things they want to buy, what kind of weapons they want to buy, or rockets or whatever they want to buy. Um, and, um, and that includes commercial stuff. You know, they really like, they really like reusable rockets the way the commercial, you know, rockets are. Um, and they are training because these guys, the space warriors, these are guys sitting at a computer <laughs> all day long. That's all they do is they sit at a computer and, but they need computer literate. They need techie people to do that. So they're training those people and finding them. Uh, what else are they doing? The only thing that I could get them to talk about more particularly was the people that, that professionally do what the amateur sky watchers do. Well, they call it space domain, space domain awareness. And sometimes they call it space surveillance. But what they're doing is just keeping track of everything that's out there, where it is and what it is and what it's doing. And that's what they do. And that's a branch of Space Force. Well, that's, that's, that leads to another question I wanted to ask you. How do we know which countries have what satellites where? Um, I, you're not going to believe me, but when I would ask questions like that, I, the answers were vague. But this is what I, I think. Uh, in the first place, you can't, you have to put a satellite up by a rocket. You tie a satellite to a rocket and send it out in space and the rocket releases it. You can't hide a rocket launch because they're, you know, you know what rocket launches look like. You can't hide that. So, and then different countries launch their rockets from particular spaces, places we don't have, okay, Kennedy everywhere, you know, we have it just one place. Um, the Russians have theirs in one or two places. China has it. I mean, the people who know this stuff know exactly where the launches are going to happen from. And <clears throat> also, um, you're supposed to, um, as a country, you're supposed to notify the other countries when you launch something into space. So um, there's a, a list, a tracking list of what's up there. Um, there's a registry, that's how to say it, there's a registry. And then there are a bunch of catalogs. Um, the Space Force has its catalog. The amateurs have their catalog. Russia has its catalog, China has its catalog. There's a bunch of catalogs of everything that's up there and what kind of orbit it's in and how big it is and how bright it is and what it seems to be, how it's behaving, what it seems to be doing. Uh, as I was saying, there's a terrific illustration in the Scientific yeah. American article. Uh, and I'm just going to hold it up. I know you can't see it, but at least it blocks my ugly uh, uh, It's it's it, What it shows is which countries own what types of satellites. It's remarkable that they were able to put, you all were able to pull all this together. Um, I mean, I spent about half an hour, probably as much time as I did reading the article, looking at the graphic. Yeah, right. yes. um, and each one of those little, like the yeah. little, these little deltas here, those are military. Um, the size um, uh, is the size of the satellite. Yes, it's and way cool. so these are all in low, low Earth orbit. And these are in Middle Earth orbit and these are in geosynchronous orbit, and other orbits and all the other countries. And I, I think this this person that put this together is a genius. And you can really see that America, the United States has just many more satellites up yes. there than anybody else. Okay. And, and in, in 2014, you tell us in the article, 
um, uh, Russia and China proposed what's called the Prevention of the Placement of Weapons in Outer Space Treaty. But the United States refused to sign it. Can you explain that? No. Um, <laughs> so it isn't only the Department of Defense that doesn't answer questions. It's also the State Department. They don't answer questions either. Um, I mean, they answer questions. And I think they have learned, they must give lessons in this, how to talk in normal English words and string those normal English words together into sentences that make no sense, whatever. They're meaningless. So I don't, I, what I understand from sort of putting together what people say and then they start to get vague right when I want them to be specific but it's probably a combination of things. Um, one of them is nobody trusts Russia and China to be honest dealers. So when they are making up a treaty, what, the, what I heard was that, the, that it was prohibiting things. The treaty would prohibit things that they are already doing. So they would prohibit anybody else from doing it. They can do it, we can't. Um, also diplomats don't like to talk about ongoing diplomacy. This is still ongoing, they're still talking about it. Um, <clears throat> also uh, Russia did, Russia and China that, I think it didn't define what a weapon was. I'm not dead sure of that, but I know that's one of the big holdups. Um, so you can ban weapons in outer space, but what's a weapon, you know? Um, sure, is it a weapon if, if, obviously it's a weapon if somebody, if you shoot something with it, but is it a weapon if you just interfere with their communication with electromagnetic radiation? Well, a lot of these satellites have little arms that can go out and do things, fix things, that they could just as easily go whack, right? So is that a weapon or is that kind of fixer satellite? Is it a weapon satellite or is it not? Um, and then how would you, you can't sign a treaty unless you know, unless you can verify that the other side is abiding by it, not cheating. Um, and they, they think that, 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 I think that Russian Chinese treaty didn't have any verification um, methods. I'm not sure about that either, but I know that's been also, that's one of the holdups in the treaties. So, and then the other thing was for the last few years, the State Department has not been operating at optimal capacity. It's, we'll, we'll try to steer away from politics. The, uh, we will. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well. <laughs> We've had enough of that in recent months. Uh, you mentioned earlier the, the amateur satellite watcher network, but you also in your article say that they're not just amateurs, that what the service they're providing is actually very important to our, to our national defenses in a sense. Can you explain what you meant by that? Well, it's not so much to our national defense. It's, to, it's more to like openness and transparency, like, you know, what's actually going on. Um, the military, I, I said there were all these catalogs um, of all the stuff out there in space, you know, what, the, what that graphic showed so well. Um, the military catalog, they have a secret catalog and then a public catalog. And the secret catalog is secret, you know, it's their spy satellites and I don't know what all is in that catalog, but, um, so what the amateurs do is look for the gaps in that, um, they, they look for the gaps in the public catalog for where they know there's a satellite, but the, the, the defense department isn't talking about it. And then they go see if they can find that satellite and they usually can. Um, they operate a number of different ways, but the, the most charming thing about them is that they are not at all paid in any way to do this. And 
they are <laughs> they operate with binoculars and a stopwatch or a backyard telescope and a stopwatch and that's it that's as high tech as they get and they keep their catalogs and their catalogs have you know the national reconnaissance the nro satellites in them um, the secret satellites and all the Russians and Chinese and Japanese and Indian and European satellites in them. And so it's like, it's a difference between having a library that you can access only part of and a library that you can access all of. And that's what they do. Those they, make it, they make it possible for us to at least get closer to accessing all of it. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. That's right. And, and remark, I didn't realize they were doing it just with a stopwatch and a telescope because it's, it's in, in your article, it's clear they make some pretty fancy calculations to turn this yeah. stuff out. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and it's much fancier than I said in the article because I couldn't understand what they were telling me. That's how much fancier it was. They, they, <laughs> they calculate an orbit, which I couldn't begin to do. And then if the satellite's been up there for a long time, they calculate how much the moon's pull on the Earth would have changed the orbit over time. So what would it have been, you know, 20 years ago? They can do stuff like that. I, there are a lot of smart people out there. Thank heavens, because I need them. I want to end with one last question. Uh, as, an, as an English major myself, and one who also became enamored of, of science early in my career, and sort of looked to it, I thought, you know, you know, I'm, this may be the end all and be all. I may go into science and learn everything I can about science, may somehow explain all the questions I have in life. Um, as someone who's now dedicated a, a, a significant portion of your life to, to learning everything you can about science and writing about it for us laymen, has it panned out? Does, has science proved to be a, a worthy god? I don't think science is a god at all. Um, I think it's a uh, it's a method. It's a technique. It's a it's a way of knowing something about the world that is ascertainable. I mean, you can double check it, and if you see it twice, that's good. Um, if somebody else can see it too, that's good. Um, so this, it's the scientific community and the way it works. It's its own self-monitoring. Um, so what science comes up with is as close to believable as anything, I don't know how to say this, I always wanted to know from the time I was, I don't know, a young person, how we know what we know. You know, is it is this whole business about what's illusion and what's real and how do we know what's real and what's real to you is that the same as what's real to me and all that other stuff. And science is a way of answering those questions that's fairly reliable. And so that's what science is to me. It's, it's a method of certainty. And one of the nicest things that the physical scientists do is they quantify certainty. So, <laughs> so they say, well, I'm, see, they, they're never 100% certain, but they'll be 99.99999% certain. And if they're only 95% certain, they don't want to talk about it. You know, when, when the world seems to be full of people who are more than willing to share their opinions about stuff they don't know anything about, scientists yes. are very careful about that. Yeah, they are. They are. So the pandemic is a good example of that. You know, be careful of which scientists you listen to. Don't listen to the physicists talking about infectious diseases. But, but listen to the, the infectious diseases guys and the epidemiologists. Listen to those guys. Um, on the other hand, some of life's biggest questions are not things that scientists can even talk about, you know, and like the question of meaning, what does it all mean? And why are we here? And 
how do I behave toward you? And how do you behave toward me? And how do we operate best as a society? Science, you know, can't touch those things. Although I do think in a sense, they give a foundation or a framework, something you can work from toward answering those questions. It, it really helps to, to have that foundation, um, that notion of what the world is in a sense. A question like, when I see red, do you see the same red that I do? You know, I don't know if science can answer that or not. I don't think they can. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, it's a and that's a nice concrete question. Yeah, it sure is. Fairly straightforward, and we're all we're all blind when it comes to that. Uh, Anne Finkbeiner, thank you so much for this. Uh, thank you for what you do with your writing. The um, um, I think I think you know. Well, I love science, but I'm not a scientist. And thanks to you, I get to enjoy a lot of different science. So thank you very much. And thank you. Thank your colleagues. Uh, thank you for being with us today. You have a good life. Okay. And you got to promise me you'll keep writing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. That's what I do. <laughs> okay. Good. Good for you. Peace. We'll see thank you, you so much. Oh, my pleasure.